Today, we are going to be talking about Sweet Baby Inc., mass reporting, omissions, bad coverage, lies, misrepresentations, and hypocrisy. Yes, you know, nothing too heavy. We're going to keep it pretty casual today. This is like a background noise type video. Sweet Baby Inc. describes themselves as a narrative development and consultation studio based in Montreal and working around the globe. Their mission is to tell better, more empathetic stories while diversifying and enriching the video game industry. They aim to make games more engaging, more fun, more meaningful, and more inclusive for everyone. They have worked on games like Alan Wake 2, Spider-Man 2, God of War Ragnarok, and Sable. Okay. Sure. Why do we care? Since the release of Alan Wake 2, posts speculating about Sweet Baby began to circulate, but it all came to a head in February. On February 29th, 2024, Chris Kindred, a narrative designer who works for Sweet Baby Inc., called out a Steam group called Sweet Baby Inc. Detected, which we will call SBI Detected from now on. So to be clear, Sweet Baby Inc. is the company, is the consultation firm. SBI Detected is the Steam Group. All right. SBI Detected is a Steam Group and curator that lists games that Sweet Baby Inc. has been involved in. Games that have an association with Sweet Baby Inc. are not recommended. On February 29th, Chris alleged that SBI Detected violated Steam's code of conduct and urged followers to report the group. They also asked followers to report the creator's Steam account as well. If you look closely, you can actually see that he owns Street Fighter 6. The chances that I have flossed this player is extremely high. Okay, just kidding. Here we're going to hit a branching path. There are three main conclusions you can draw from this. One, regardless of the circumstances, it is wrong to mass report a person or a group even if that group is violating a website's code of conduct. It is wrong to mass report them. Or two, it is okay to mass report a person or group if they are violating the website's terms of conditions, but SBI detected was not violating the code of conduct. Therefore, Chris Kindred's call for mass report is unjustified. Or finally, three, it is okay to mass report a person or a group if they are violating a website's terms of service. And SBI detected was violating rules and conduct. Therefore, Chris Kindred's call for a mass report is justified. If you subscribe to conclusion one, there's nothing else to talk about. It's a fact. Chris Kindred called for a group to be mass reported. I think most people either subscribe to conclusion two or three. It's okay to call for a mass report only if that person or group is violating terms of service slash code of conduct. So to determine whether or not this group was violating Steam's code of conduct and determine whether or not this call for a mass report was justified, we need to find evidence of this. I have seen no evidence that the creator himself has violated Steam's code of conduct. So with what I have in front of me right now, I want to say that it's not justified to call for the mass report of the group's creator. But what about the group or curator's page? That's kind of close to creator, but you, you can hear the difference, right? There is compelling evidence that the group might have violated the Steam's code of conduct. But from what I can find, these violations only led to warnings from Steam. I cannot find any hard evidence that the group violated code of conduct before Chris Kindred's original tweet on February 29th. We will get into reporting later, don't worry, but for now, Bryant Francis from The Game Developer wrote this. When we first viewed Sweet Baby Inc. Detected Group's Steam discussion page, the array of conspiracy-laden rants about the company were accompanied by messages from the organizer exhorting new members not to violate Valve's terms of service. The forms on that page have since been removed, with the organizer stating that an influx of severe bad actors led to Steam support to reach out to the group in some fashion. On March 9th, a moderator of the group posted, well, my friends, three days ago, I got a message from Steam support that this group was receiving too many reports slash flags, and it could result into the group and the curator getting deleted. And since that day, I've been talking to Steam support and making sure we were following Steam's TOS. So I had to delete every single discussion thread with the help of other mods, and I couldn't thank them enough for this help. Since now we are on good terms with Steam, I decided to lock new threads to prevent the worst. That's all for now, folks. So... Mods did have to work with Steam. They deleted every discussion thread. So it is likely that there was some activity in the group that violated Steam's code of conduct. But a discussion post on March 9th isn't enough to conclude that these violations were present before Chris's February 29th post, which boosted the group's population greatly. 
I also saw this exchange between Mudahar, a creepypasta review channel who covered Sweet Baby Inc., and Chris Kindred. Mudahar argues that the harassment campaign didn't start until Chris asked for the Steam group to be reported, which he posts screenshots of. Chris's response is that harassment started in October and censored, which is true, but that doesn't really address the point that I think Mudahar was trying to make, which is specifically about the Steam group. Mudahar responds, I see you linked a separate site than the Steam curator groups the screenshot is depicting. And Chris responds, I see you don't understand context either. Which is a disappointing response, but we will get into what I think they mean by this in a second. I feel like this exchange is a missed opportunity by Chris to provide evidence of the group violating Steam's TOS before February 29th. Since Chris originally claimed that the group violated code of conduct, I believe the onus is on them to support that claim. So heading back to this response, it is a little cryptic and I wasn't able to get a hold of Chris, but after some digging, I kind of think I understand what they might mean. Again, this is just my speculation of Chris's argument, but I believe that Chris might believe the SBI detected the Steam group might have had a close relation to the website that was actually harassing Sweet Baby Inc. It is plausible. This website was celebrating SBI detected the day before Chris posted about it, but without any hard evidence linking the two groups together, I don't think you have enough evidence to target the Steam group itself. There are some other instances of Sweet Baby Inc. employees that might put a bad taste in your mouth. I will not cover all of them here, only because I feel like they've been covered to death. I'll refer you back to the Creepypasta channel, TLDR. There are some tweets made by employees that include things like, white people gross me out. I generally don't care about Twitter activity, especially really old Twitter activity like this, but I would say inflammatory rhetoric like this is counterproductive, and I think it holds back DEI. You can push diverse voices over, without pulling white people or other races back. I think it pushes away people who would otherwise be interested in DEI, and I think it gives ammo to people who oppose, and now harass, you. But there actually have been a couple things that have happened since this video uh, that are very big, and both of them are Chris tweets, of course. Uh, the first one being Chris doubling down on wanting the group to be banned. The second one being a very intentionally and poorly timed Dragon Ball hot take on the day the creator died. Even if you're okay with DEI, I would understand why people would not like the employees at Sweet Baby Inc. After Chris Kindred's tweets about SBI Detected were posted, interest and criticism targeted at Sweet Baby Inc. increased, as well as conspiracy theories that we will get into. When larger video game publications covered the harassment of Sweet Baby Inc., they left out the fact that there wasn't much harassment or even criticism of Sweet Baby Inc. comparatively until after Chris made their tweets targeting the Steam group. I think this looks very bad optically. The fact that Wired, Kotaku, The Verge, and Game Developer all made articles related to this situation but failed to mention this pours fuel to the fire. If you aren't observing the situation in extremely good faith, like I always do of course, it seems like these publications are maliciously omitting this part of the story. I think this is also bad because I think it leaves out one huge aspect of the SBI detected Steam group. An admittedly unquantifiable, but in my opinion large, number of people who are a part of the group claim they are opposed to Sweet Baby Inc. specifically because Chris wanted to report the group. These members may not even buy into conspiracies about Sweet Baby Inc. They may even be fine with explicit DEI in their games. I also have to take in consideration that I don't think you're obligated to mention Chris's tweet in every single article about Sweet Baby Inc., especially if you are more focused on debunking the conspiracy theories related to Sweet Baby Inc. But at the end of the day, I think if SBI Detected is mentioned or talked about, I think it's important context to mention, even if it's just in a separate linked article. It would be nice to have one of these publications with connections and resources look into the claim that Chris Kindred originally made. If a journalist was able to check the Steam page before February 29th and before it was nuked, and if they were able to confirm Chris was right when they said the group violated Steam's TOS, that would be huge. As mentioned above, Bryant Francis details harassment that could have occurred after the 29th, but if they could have investigated activity before the 29th, that would have been very useful. The creator of the group and many others claim that Chris started the harassment. This claim goes undiscussed and unchecked. Is it because he is correct? Is it because we can't check? Either way, it would be very useful if we could fact check these claims. 
In an interview with Gamers and Geeks on March 7th, the creator of SBI Detected said the following about the Kotaku report. I don't think the article is accurate at all. First, it says we're harassing Sweet Baby Inc. when in, in fact, it was a Sweet Baby Inc. employee who tried to start a harassment campaign against me. Quick little point here. It could be true that Chris's call for a mass report on February 29th is unjustified and the group went on to harass Sweet Baby Inc. after that date. These two things are mutually exclusive. Cabrutus' statement makes it sound like only one party could have harassed the other. I don't want to repeat myself too much, but I feel like the articles would have been better if they added this context and if they could have investigated these claims. If, hey, Cabrutus is right and Chris did initiate the harassment, that doesn't change much of your story. The conspiracy theories would still be conspiracy theories. I just don't understand why we are mentioning SBI Detected, but we aren't talking about the tweets. Well, congratulations. You've reached the end of part one. In this part, it was my goal to explain criticism related to this situation, which I thought were at least rooted in facts. And these are just some of the more popular things. If the employee's tweets, opinions, or reporting are the reason you aren't a fan of the company, I can understand that. This obviously is not an invitation to harass anyone, of course, but I think as of right now, it's acceptable criticism. In its current state, I also believe the Steam group and the curator's existence is acceptable. Although I probably disagree with their opinions on DEI or many of the things we're about to get into, I support making it easy for people to boycott things they're opposed to. And the creator seems to be making steps to keep the Steam group TOS compliant. Whenever you're in the situation where there is legitimate criticism against a group or a person, but there's also a ton of hate, harassment, and illegitimate criticism, if you want your legitimate criticism to get across, and if you want to look like a principled person, you have to also call out, identify, and disavow all of that hate, harassment, and illegitimate criticism. Practically speaking, your legitimate criticism will never be heard or addressed if you don't also try to shut down all of the hate and harassment that person or group is getting. Now we're going to go over the claims made by opponents of Sweet Baby Inc., including the founder of the group himself. These claims have been labeled conspiracy theories, a truly justified designation. These claims are not based in fact. They are based on politically biased assumptions, cut out of context clips, and much more. So let's talk about forced diversity. This phrase used to explain diversity that felt forced, especially in entertainment. You do have that minority in the game, but they aren't well written or they are tokenized because there wasn't enough thought put into the character or their existence. This is similar to the phrase forced smile, but now the phrase is beginning to mean something totally different and is the claim behind the aforementioned conspiracy theory. Many members of SBI Detected, including the founder, unironically and literally believe that Sweet Baby Inc. is forcing game developers to make their games more diverse or woke. In a Twitter exchange between Verge journalist Ash Parrish and the Twitter user named Anthony is back, Ash asks Anthony to identify which parts of God of War, Suicide Squad, and Alan Wake 2 were written by Sweet Baby Inc. She also asks for proof. This tweet was quote retweeted by another Twitter user by the name of Endym Endymion? 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 With over 13,000 likes and hundreds of thousands of views. In this tweet, Endymion claims that the director of Alan Wake 2, Kyle Rowley, quote unquote, openly admitted in a game developer.com interview that Saga Anderson, who was originally a white woman with blonde hair and blue eyes in Quantum Break, as pictured here, was changed due to the influence of Kim Belair, the co-founder of Sweet Baby Inc. When Endymion says that Saga was changed due to the influence of Kim Belair, he words it in a vague way that implies Kim Belair and Sweet Baby Inc. might have been the reason Saga's race was changed. If you were to read the screenshot in Endymion's post, and not just the highlighted portions he wants you to see, you would see that Kyle Rowley, the game director of Alan Wake 2, says Kim Belair helped with the character voice and character arc, neither of which are character design. Additionally, it is important to note that on March 4th, 10 entire days before this tweet, Kyle Rowley, the same person Endymion is citing, 
debunked the idea that Sager Anderson would be white if it weren't for Sweet Baby Ink's involvement. And Demion's summarization leaves these details out, which seems to be intentional. But it could also be the case that Endymion was not familiar with this clarification. Either way, I would argue that if you're being critical of game journalists leaving important facts out of the story, you shouldn't do the same thing. As always, whenever bad actors get ousted, they run hit pieces and campaigns to change the narrative surrounding the situation. And if you go to any of these mainstream media news outlets who've come in defense of Sweet Baby and others, they all conveniently forget why this Gamergate 2 nonsense is happening to begin with. If you make it your job to make daily videos on the topic, you should be informed enough to provide your followers with this important context. Now let's talk about how much you would have to believe to conclude that Sweet Baby Inc. secretly was the reason behind Saga's race change. The first thing you would have to believe is that Remedy was okay with hiring Sweet Baby Inc., but for some reason was opposed to changing Saga Anderson's race themselves. And then you would have to believe that Kyle Rowley, the game director, is lying not only in his original interview when he talks about Kim Belair's involvement, but he's also lying in the follow-up tweet. And then you would have to believe that Sweet Baby Inc. lied on their website where they described their involvement with Alan Wake 2. And then, on top of all of that, you'd also have to believe that everyone else who was involved in this process who could have potentially known about this is also keeping it a secret. Or you can compare that to the alternative explanation that Remedy is telling the truth, and Remedy, a studio that is comfortable with hiring Sweet Baby Inc., is also comfortable with changing the race of their own character without external pressure. It is clear that you'd have to actively engage in mental gymnastics to believe that Sweet Baby Inc. was the reason behind Saga's race change based on the evidence that we have today. This is why it's called a conspiracy. Instead of believing that Remedy changed Saga Anderson under their free will, people are instead trying to concoct a reality where Sweet Baby Inc. is so powerful they can pressure Remedy into making this change and forcing everyone else around them to stay quiet or lie on their behalf. To put some sprinkles on this cupcake, this isn't even the first time Remedy has changed a character's race or gender. Here's a clip from Hidden Machine's video breaking down the return trailer from Alan Wake 2, months before Sweet Baby Detected was even created. Now, I want to take a detour here and discuss Saga Anderson for a moment, because I've seen way too many race-baiting comments online in reference to Remedy's choice to cast Melanie Liebert in this role. There are some people out there claiming to be upset over a character who was formerly portrayed by a white actress now being portrayed by a black actress. I don't really care to entertain claims of some sort of woke agenda, but I've seen this come up so often that I feel the need to address it if we're going to be discussing this particular video. And this video that we're discussing was just meant to give fans a glimpse of what Alan Wake 2 could look like, and to illustrate some of the story elements and concepts that Remedy was hoping to eventually explore. This video was made eight years ago, and it's basically live action concept art. Now, I've seen some people online claim that Remedy would have never taken a formerly black character and, you know, turned them into a white character, but... If you look at the concept art for Langston from Control, we can see that Langston is not white in this concept art. And the reason for that is because when you're in the concept phase, you don't know who the actors are going to be that will eventually portray these characters. And that's why you'll see the race or gender of certain characters change when moving from the concept phase to the casting phase. Now, like I said, sometimes casting a character will mean that the gender, race, or sometimes even general age of that character is going to change. But beyond that, Remedy recast every major actor in the Max Payne series after the first game. And they released a bunch of early Quantum Break footage showing different actors portraying Jack Joyce. Casting and recasting is just something that happens, and to attach a bunch of racially motivated paranoia to it is just stupid. And I know that in spite of all of that, some people out there are going to continue to be race-baiting goons who will just believe whatever they want to believe. But if you are someone who is genuinely and innocently curious about why the race, gender, or general appearance of a character might change, over the course of eight years, just remember going from concept to casting 
things are going to change. And this particular video was never intended to be anything official. And all that's happened now is since Alan Wake 2 actually went into production, they found who they wanted to portray the character of Saga Anderson. And it happens to be Melanie Liburd. Sadly for Endymion, the first part of the tweet featuring Alan Wake 2 was the only part of this tweet that he even tried to provide evidence of Sweet Baby Inc. influence. The remainder of his tweet is just speculation and or his opinion what he views as a double standard. These are interesting topics that can be discussed, but it isn't related to the question being asked. He doesn't even try to provide any proof that Sweet Baby Inc. wrote the elements that he's calling out in this post. I also think the end of this tweet is super funny. You can play stupid all you want, that's fine, but don't pretend that Sweet Baby Inc involvement has not on purpose ruined everything they've touched for agenda purposes. Stop being a dumbass yes man and admit the facts do not align with your woke nonsensical viewpoints. This is really this is funny because he has no clue what Sweet Baby Inc has written for these games. He's asking us to admit to the facts, but as exemplified in our Alan Wake example, he has no facts. He's just assuming the stuff he doesn't like is written by Sweet Baby Inc. He provides no evidence that these ideas weren't just made by the devs of each respective game. I saw another example of assumptions gone wrong in a video by the YouTuber It's a Gundam and an even more embarrassing example. Ricky over on Twitter pointed out when Suicide Squad launched, the developer and Sweet Baby Inc. was doing victory laps because... After 11 years in the industry, I finally did it. A black character on the front cover of a AAA game. A dream come true, y'all. And Kim doing the clap emoji. So glad you were present to help mold his character, Kim. Basically, Sweet Baby Inc. was behind turning Deadshot into a black guy. So It's a Gundam explained that Del Walker then an artist for Rocksteady, was excited because they finally did it. Del Walker is celebrating a black character on the front of a AAA game after 11 years, but since Del Walker thanked Kim for helping mold the character Deadshot, It's a Gundam thinks that automatically means that Sweet Baby Inc. were the ones behind the decision to make Deadshot black. No additional evidence was needed for this claim. To be clear, this is an insane assumption given the context, especially since Sweet Baby Inc only credit themselves with script writing, including things like banter, cutscenes, bark, audio logs, etc. I haven't played Suicide Squad, but unless there's specific banter in this game that turns Deadshot black mid-conversation, But if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Batman, and you are black, I think it's pretty safe to say that race is more related to character design than it is to cutscenes and audio logs. But my favorite part is next, when It's a Gundam rants against ignorance while misunderstanding what he's reading. Also, this is the first black character on a AAA game if you're willfully ignorant. The problem with these hyper-progressives in every sense of the word is they have to pretend that everything they do is the first time. Disney does it with their first gay character like almost yearly at this point. And if we look at gaming, there's countless games that have black characters on the cover. What the hell is he talking about? No one made this claim that Deadshot was the first black character on the case of a AAA game. That claim is presented a total of zero times in this tweet. I don't even know how he landed on that conclusion. AAA gaming has existed for more than 11 years. If you know anything about gaming and you're over the age of 11, you would know that. Since Del Walker celebrated 11 years of working in the industry just a few months before this post, don't you think it's much more likely that Del is celebrating a personal goal? In the first part of my video, I try to extend extreme good faith to Sweet Baby Inc. and the reporters. While it could be the case that an action is taken maliciously, it could also be for a more benign reason, like a misunderstanding. I'll do the same for these YouTubers. Could it be the case that Endymion and It's a Gundam purposely mischaracterize people in statements to suit their narrative? Yes. But it could also be the case that they are so hasty to dunk on their opponents, they don't take the time to actually consider what their opponents are saying. Something I have noticed about these movements is that every single comment you make can be misconstrued and built into a talking point. This tweet was from years ago. If you're going to go back years to dig up a random tweet to rant about in a video, don't you think you should at least understand its context? Okay, so maybe we can't point to specific evidence proving Sweet Baby Inc. forces game studios to be more diverse or woke. Do we have anything else? 
Do we have circumstantial evidence? Here's another very viral tweet with over 1.5 million views and over 10,000 likes. The caption reads, the co-founder of Sweet Baby Inc., Kim Belair, proudly explains the method she uses to force bosses at game studios to censor, alter, and diversify game projects she feels are problematic. Terrify them, aka threaten them with anger of the cancel culture mob. If you're a creative working in AAA, which I did for many, many years, um, put this stuff up to your higher-ups. And if they don't see the value in what you're asking for when you ask for consultants, when you ask for research, go have a coffee with your marketing team and just terrify them with the possibility of what's going to happen if they don't give you what you want. When I saw this clip, I thought it was pretty bad, honestly. Then I remembered a rule that I believe everyone should follow. If there's a very short clip of someone who is highly polarizing or widely hated, what are the chances that the clip is in good faith? Of course the chances are slim to none. Here's that same clip with additional context. Um, if you're a creative working in AAA, which I did for many, many years, um, put this stuff up to your higher-ups. And if they don't see the value in what you're asking for when you ask for consultants, when you ask for research, go have a coffee with your marketing team and just terrify them with the possibility of what's gonna happen if they don't give you what you want. Because they have to consider, like, I, I say that all out as a joke, but it's- If any clip ends right before someone says, just kidding, it was cut to be malicious. There's no amount of good faith that can save you from that. Here's even more additional context. I say that all out as a joke, but it's actually very, very true because if you start to consider the people who are player and audience facing and who have to deal with mitigating harm and with keeping the sentiment around their game and their project positive, there's like a genuine value that you can impress upon them with um, both ethically and financially. You can say this is important. And it's also a valid discussion to have because if you're working with a very thin narrative budget and you work in AAA, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised or dismayed by the amount of money that marketing can give you. Of course, not everyone who spread the clip knew it was maliciously cut, obviously. But for anybody who shared this clip uncritically, I can't determine if they were intentionally and knowingly spreading this out of context clip or if they're just unaware that it is good practice to check very short and controversial clips of widely controversial people. So let's break down the claim in the tweet. The co-founder of Sweet Baby Inc., Kim Belair, proudly explains the method she uses to force bosses at game studios. This part of the claim is just inaccurate. You could actually debunk this even with the original out-of-context clip. Kim is not talking about the method she uses. Kim Belair does not work for a AAA company. Claiming that this method is the method she uses is incorrect. She is recommending this method to creatives who work in AAA studios. Now let's get to the second part. The co-founder of Sweet Baby Inc., Kim Belair, proudly explains the method she uses to force bosses at game studios to censor, alter, and diversify game projects she feels are problematic. Expressing the value of hiring consultants is not analogous to forcing censorship, alterations, or even diversity in the game project. Eventually, if the game company is convinced to hire consultants, consultants may make recommendations that censor, alter, or diversify the game, but it isn't by force. Whenever you see someone type or say AKA when summarizing a person they don't like, it is probably an inaccurate summarization. Given the context, it's obvious that there is no threat here. Kim Belair is not saying, if you don't hire consultants, I'm going to do X. That's not the case. There is a difference between convincing someone to do something and coercing or forcing them to do it. When you are selling a preventative or insurance type product, quote unquote terrifying the person you are convincing isn't morally wrong, as long as you're not intentionally misleading them or coercing them. Here are a couple of examples. If you're selling bear spray and you use bear attack statistics to terrify your clients to purchase your product, there's nothing wrong with that, assuming you're being truthful and you aren't coercing them. This method of selling your product is fine. If you and your business partner are writing a legal agreement for a third party and they don't want to get a lawyer to double check your document, you can terrify them using examples of shoddy business agreements that have financially ruined companies. This method of convincing your partner to pay for a lawyer is fine. Or, we're coming full circle here, if you're a consultant, you can terrify your clients by telling them that they might push some customers away inadvertently because of something they didn't realize was offensive. This method of convincing your client to do business 
again, is fine, as long as you're not intentionally misleading or coercing them. None of these examples are threats. There is no retaliation if the client does not do what the seller wants. Notifying a prospective customer of the potential negative outcomes of not purchasing a product or service is not coercion. It is not force. It is not censorship. Anyone who equated terrified to any of these things is just flat out incorrect. There are contexts where terrifying someone could be coercion, but it is clear that this isn't one of them. Does the sentence on the slide stating, build connections with the marketing team to express the value of inclusion sound like coercion? Does the sentence, there is a genuine value that you can impress upon them, both ethically and financially, sound like coercion or a sales pitch? Even though I believe I've sufficiently beat this claim to death only by showing you the context of the clip, I also want to show an additional clip that defeats this theory. Earlier in the seminar, Kim Belair talks about a situation where a game developer did not take her suggestion. What was your ex like? Which is a bit much for a first date, <laughs> but um, the player can either choose to say, okay, my ex was a good person, but it didn't work out. They can choose to say, I don't know if I really want to talk about that, or they can choose to say, my ex was a monster. And choosing my ex was a monster, the woman on the date with you goes like, yikes, you must be so immature if that's what you're gonna say on a date about your ex. Like you must be not over this, you must be figuring something out. And I think that you lose favor in that moment with that character. And I can see where the design was. Like I understand that what they wanted to do was just have a very simple question where if you respond, your ex can, or your date can say, I like that, or I don't like that, or kind of be neutral about it. But I played through that, and I realized something that they hadn't really seen, and it's that this question was deeply gendered, despite the fact that they didn't even intend that. Um, when we treat, I guess, cis, hetero, male characters as the default, we end up like questions like this. And I say that because while it's a generalization, when we have those characters and they say something like, hey, my ex is a monster, what we're being asked to assume is that that person has a crazy ex-girlfriend. We're being asked to assume that they're being immature or they might have you know, a real harpy at home. It's almost like a laugh line a lot of the time. So I asked, hey, what if I'm playing as a woman? Because what I had to explain very delicately was that if I'm playing as a woman, and I'm assuming that I'm interacting with a woman and we don't know about my ex, there's an upsettingly high likelihood that when I say to another woman, my ex was a monster, what I'm referring to was an abusive situation rather than just an immature joke. And so I actually said, you know what though, don't worry about it. We can create a condition for this because if you respond to that person by saying, hey, my ex was a monster, what if she digs a little deeper? What if she checks and says, hey, is that a pain point for you? Or says like, oh, is that something touchy for you? Or maybe says like, do you mean that as a flippant remark? Because I think that even though you know, this game is light, it would be a genuinely important moment to be able to express that sentiment in a game. And when I suggested that, the writing team was like, okay, thank you for this insight. And then they just like took it away. They got nervous, and I think that is the problem that we face when we think of representation as a challenge that we just need to like surmount. We could just like go, oh, nope, solved, we did it, because we took it away and we don't have to face it anymore. But I thought here, this was an opportunity for innovation. Here we had the chance to make a woman who has been victimized see herself in a game, be able to express something to another woman in a game, and kind of actually relate to it. And we had that opportunity, but instead, we pulled back because we thought it was safer not to push forward. And after the whole thing was done, the team thanked me again, and they said, like, thanks so much, you really mitigated the risk. She thought that adding a dialogue option would make it more inclusive and more relatable without taking away the original and potentially offensive interaction. The game developers decided to scrap the dialogue entirely, which Kim explained was disappointing, but she didn't force or coerce them into making the change she wanted. The out of context clip was already bad enough, but the fact that this portion of the seminar where Kim literally does the opposite of censorship and coercion tells you all you need to know about the origin of this clip. 
Now that we know the context, can we watch someone react to the original out of context clip in real time? We can't? Okay, okay. Here is a clip from Side Scrollers. I think it's important to note that the creator of this thumbnail went out of their way and literally crossed off the words in Kim Belair's presentation so that they can put their own bias summarization. Here's the clip. This is the CEO of Sweet Baby Inc. talking about bringing marginalized collaborators into these AAA studios and how they're able to do it. Uh, let's take a look at this video really quick. The threaten? That is so par for the course for that whole side of the, of the movement. People, I know they hate the term woke or whatever, but that's just so par for the course for them. It's like they use intimidation tactics through cry bullying through, okay, let's make them feel like they have to accept our ideologies or they have to uh, be, have consulting like this now, or they can't have female characters that look beautiful or this, that, or the other, because if so, then we're going to, uh, the, the social repercussions are going to be, they're a bigot, they're a misogynist, they're this, they're that, they're the other. It is cry bullying. This is very, and, and speaking of toxic things, this is a very toxic feminine tactic to use uh, as intimidation. Uh, they want to talk about toxic masculinity all the time, but this is toxic femininity in full force. If they can't get their way, then they will manipulate you and they will try to ruin your reputation. So instead of, oh, we don't want people to think we're bad people, we have to fold, we have to cave, we have to do this, that, or the other and jump through their hoops. It's ridiculous. Here's a clip of that very same host of side scrollers claiming he does not trust any media. Do not trust any media, nope. whether it's left, right, or middle. I don't trust any mainstream media at all. Mm -hmm. And that is why I've gotten more skeptic when it comes yeah. to everything that's being touched. And you say, well, why do you not trust any any of this? Well, look right in front of you. Like they're giving you examples. It's it's sheer gaslighting. And it's it's amazing to see like just the absolute um, lies that are associated with these people and the agenda attached to fitting their narrative, whatever side of the story you want to put it, right? The idea of, of having journalism down the middle is dead. If you're willing to make conclusions and spread a 20 second out of context clip, you are not a skeptic. People like this will shout from the rooftops that game journalists aren't reporting the full story, which I agree can sometimes be true. But then they will either uncritically or intentionally spread and make conclusions using clips like these made with the intent to misrepresent the people they don't like. I wanted to point out that this section includes arguments that I think are bad when we dig into them. This is much different than the previous section. Making what I think is a bad argument is not on the same level as taking someone out of context, misrepresenting your opponents, or leaving important information out of your summaries. I'm just going to cover two arguments because I'm an accountant and they're related to business. In a clip from Asmongold's channel, reacting to the infamous Terrify clip, this is what he had to say. Okay, let's listen to what's said. You want. Um, right. And so let me explain really what that terror is. Five tweets that go viral and then nobody actually cares after that. And I'll give some examples for that. So number one, Final Fantasy 16 was criticized tremendously because it didn't have representation of different races and the game was massively successful. Another good example is Hogwarts Legacy. Like based off of the feedback and the information that was online, it probably was like half the game killing gay people. I mean, it has to be, right? But whenever you play the game, you know that's not the case. And on top of that, it was the best selling game last year. It sold like 20 million copies. So if they're trying to terrify these media and these marketing teams, cancel culture mobs, and people getting angry on Twitter don't mean anything. It's just completely vapid garbage. It's vapid hot air. There's like a genuine value that you can impress upon them, both ethically and financially. You could say this is important. And it's also- Nobody actually cares after that is a statement that is not supported by evidence and almost certainly isn't true. This analysis ignores opportunity cost. Final Fantasy 16 and Hogwarts Legacy sold well despite controversy, but they could have sold better. There's always outrage about race swapped characters. I cannot claim that nobody cares about race swapping if the game sells well. These are mutually exclusive statements that don't prove each other. I'm sure people actually did decide to skip Alan Wake 2 because Saga Anderson's race was changed, but Alan Wake 2 is selling very well. So let's make a calculation for Final Fantasy 16 adding people of color into their game. And this is all made up. This is just to show you what opportunity cost looks like. As of the end of launch week, Final Fantasy 16 sold 3 million copies. 
It could be the case that the game sold 3.1 million copies during launch week if there were more people of color in the game and there was less controversy. Although 3 million copies is a lot, it doesn't mean that there couldn't be more or that nobody cares about these controversies. And hey, maybe, maybe your opportunity cost calculation leads you in the opposite direction. Since Hogwarts Legacy is already associated with J.K. Rowling, I don't think you can get her name off of that. Maybe the game would have just sold less if you hired a DEI consulting firm. Maybe this would be because the audience you're hiring the consultant firm to help you with is already boycotting the game. If a consultancy group is able to convince a game company that their services will lead to more revenue than loss, then it would be a good investment regardless of how much the game is going to sell. If a consultant costs $10,000 and only brings in a small audience of 1000 100 additional purchases while pushing away 100 people, that's potentially $70,000 before marketplace fees and retail pricing. Yes, this calculation is very hard to do in real time, and it's going to be different for every single game. But just because it's hard doesn't mean we could just hand wave it away and say, hey, the game sold well, so it couldn't have sold better if we didn't do other things. Also, although it's very hard to identify how effective these online boycotts and controversies are when it comes to game sales, it is presumptuous to say that they had no effect. This even includes SBI detected right now. Currently, it has 300,000 members, but we know very little about these people because of the nature of the internet, so it's hard to say how much of an effect they will ultimately have. And once it happens, it's actually going to be very hard to measure. It could be the case that the group has little effect on Sweet Baby Inc. associated games because they, maybe they were never going to even buy your game in the first place. Maybe many of these members don't even buy games. Maybe they grind CS2 20 hours a day, I don't know. Maybe they're huge pirates. Maybe they were never interested in your game in the first place. They were never part of your target market. Six-year-olds can maybe get together and have one of the biggest boycotts of all time. But six-year-olds boycotting alcoholic beverages is probably not going to affect that beverage's sales. On the other hand, some people in the group may buy the game despite being part of the group. I had to join the group for this video, so technically I fall into that category. TLDR, just because a game sells well doesn't mean controversy didn't hold it back from selling better. Just because a game sells poorly doesn't mean controversy was the reason it sold poorly. These controversies in hard to measure degrees affect both the game that sells well and the game that sells poorly, but it is very hard to quantify. When writing this video, I had to browse in Demion's tweets. I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing any additional tweets clarifying his summarization of Alan Wake 2's race swap. While searching, I saw this tweet. Twitter user Levi L. Winslow wrote the following tweet. The most ironic, maybe telling, part about the Sweet Baby Inc. discourse is that these gamers are mad at games that have not only sold well, but scored well with critics and fans. Alan Wake 2, God of War Ragnarok, Sable, Spider-Man 2, all games people really like. And Dimion says, stop lying. And he posts an article headline that says, Alan Wake 2 has yet to turn a profit for Remedy. Welcome to Accounting 101. Here we will define simple terms. LOL. Sales refers to revenue. That is the money an entity brings in. Cost refers to expenses that you have to incur to generate the revenue. Profit or loss is the money generated from sales subtracted by your cost. If your revenue is greater than your expenses, you have a net profit. If your revenue is less than your costs, you have a net loss. The term sell well is not a term with a concrete meaning. I personally think something can sell well, but not make a profit. Endymion presenting a loss as evidence that the game didn't sell well implies that you have to make a net profit to sell well. Let's say a company spent $9 billion to make a $1 product. Then they sell this product to literally every single person on the earth. They still wouldn't make a profit. It would be silly to claim that the product didn't sell well. You sold it to literally everybody. It would be more accurate to say that the costs were too high or the price was too low, not that it didn't sell well. When you boil sales performance to net income or net loss, you lose out on the reason why we use these different terms in the first place.
But let's be clear. Alan Wake 2 isn't in this situation. Just because it currently hasn't made a profit yet doesn't mean it isn't going to. In fact, Alan Wake 2 is selling faster than any Remedy game. It is pretty silly to say that Remedy's fastest selling game isn't selling well, right? Always be skeptical if someone is posting a headline or a snippet of an article, but do not link to the article. To be fair, it leaves out key details that let you know how well Alan Wake 2 is actually doing. If you head to Remedy's announcement of sales to investors this article was based on, you can see that Alan Wake 2 sold 50% more copies and three times more digital copies in the first two months than Control did in its first four months. As Remedy says, a great game can generate excellent long tail sales, and we expect this to be the case with Alan Wake 2 as well. Just because you don't make all of your money back in one day doesn't mean you aren't going to. So even if your definition of selling well was based purely on net income, it still wasn't a good argument when we look at the number because Alan Wake 2 is quite obviously on track to make a profit. If your definition of selling well can't be applied to something that is obviously on track to be profitable, congrats, your definition has no utility. It's analogous with the word net profit, a word that already exists. This doesn't even take into consideration that you are going to buy Alan Wake 1 and 2 right now. You are going to buy Alan the audacity to call somebody else a liar because they don't agree with what you think the word sells well should mean is pretty telling of the mindset these people have when they are engaging with people they disagree with. The original tweet stated that God of War, Alan Week 2, Spider-Man 2, and Sable all sold well and were well received. For someone to previously claim that Sweet Baby Inc. ruins everything they touch, you would think he would have a stronger argument that addresses the critical and financial successes of these games. Hello, welcome to the end of the video. It's over. I'm just going to talk about my opinions on the matters discussed in the video, how it affects me, my consuming habits, all of that. Um, if you want to be correct all the time and you want to just copy my opinion, that is okay because my opinion is correct. I don't agree with some of the things Sweet Baby Inc. employees have said or done. Obviously, I criticized them in this video. Actually, before I did research for this video, I was super skeptical about the value Sweet Baby Inc. brings to gaming. Just like in Dimion, I can't point to specific Sweet Baby Inc. writing that's spectacular or good. I don't really think this is something you can ever do when multiple writers work on a project. Unless like you have, unless you could see what each person does, really. All I could do is point to what they've made generally, and I think they have a pretty good track record. But then I realized that doesn't even really matter. It's not my call to determine if Sweet Baby Inc. is or isn't valuable. I don't work for a game studio. I'm pretty sure I don't have all the information they do. It's the job of the game studio to make these value judgments. Personally, I was actually pretty impressed with Kim Belair when she wasn't getting cut out of context. Yes, Sweet Baby Inc. wants more diverse games. From what I saw in the seminar, in the interviews that I've read, Kim Belair wants a good diverse character in the game. Kim Belair wants a good story. If diversity is in a game, but it's not good, that doesn't help anybody. In the end, Sweet Baby Inc. being involved with a game is not make or break for me because I believe in the death of the artist. Generally speaking, if game will be good, I'll get the game. If the game will be bad, I won't get that game. If a game is made by Sweet Baby Inc., that's f Or if it's made by someone else on the other side of the political spectrum, I don't know, <laughs> Colin Moriarty, that's also fine. There are only two political parties, Colin Moriarty and Sweet Baby Inc. I better not catch you voting third party. When I buy products I like, I vote with my wallet. If you don't already, I hope you diversify the places you get your news from. Get it? I used the word. Someone could be critical and hypocritical at the same time, as we saw many times in this video. If you watch 10 videos bashing Sweet Baby Inc., try to at least watch a couple that are positive. When you watch those videos, make sure you're watching those videos, not your favorite e-celeb chopping up that video to dunk on it. If you're curious about any of the videos I showed today, watch the full version. Maybe only watch my videos after you're sure I put the full context into each clip. I'm sure I could have gotten a bunch more mainstream articles that omitted Chris's tweets. I also could have gotten a whole bunch of other examples of YouTubers doing things they would be critical of others for doing. 
like this YouTuber, Hypnotic. So what I've seen from this person, especially their thumbnails, obviously their thumbnails are look pretty crazy, but what I'm seeing is I'm seeing the Kotaku reporter and a speech bubble coming out of their mouth and a quote that I'm pretty sure is fake. I can't, I can't find it anywhere. I looked for it. Um, and I, I watched the video and this quote is like not addressed at all in the video. Um, so like if Kotaku were to make a thumbnail of an article with Cabrutus and put a quote that they never substantiate in the article, people would be freaking out. But since Hypnotic does it, nobody says anything. 5.5K views in three hours. And this quote he has in the thumbnail isn't even talked about in the video. I don't even know if it's real. And this is like one of the more tame ones. There, he puts crazy quotes I can't find in these thumbnails. I just, I, I also, if it is not obvious, I hate conspiracy theories. People will argue that claims that can ruin someone's life should require evidence. They say things like, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. They will then make an extraordinary claim like coercion with absolutely no evidence. It's the biggest hypocrisy. Also, shout out to Hidden Machine. I used a lot of his video in my video. Uh, I thought it was really, really good stuff. And of course, I'm not trying to get each bomber guide out here. So it was nice that he let me use it. Shout out to my buddy Clyde. Uh, I probably don't make this video if we don't bounce ideas off each other. So I always appreciate that. But yeah, that's all I got. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs>